Ancient Indo-European warriors formed a cultic warband called a Kurios. They were sworn to the god of the warband and were transformed into wolves. And, ejected from their homes, they would live in the wilderness for a time and prey upon outsiders. But they were something else too, something far darker and far stranger. I'm Dan Davis, I'm a novelist, and on this channel we talk about the real history behind my historical fantasy stories. And this is the story of the Bronze Age Army of the Dead. Chorios is the Proto-Indo-European word for the warbands of adolescent youths in their late teenage years who were banished temporarily from their homes for the final part of their coming-of-age rites. We know what these warbands, these cultic brotherhoods, were like, thanks to more than a century of work in linguistics, mythology, anthropology, folklore, history and archaeology. Descendant Indo-European cultures across Eurasia continued these practices from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age and on into the medieval era and even into the early 20th century when many folk traditions still survived in rural areas. Looking at one of these later traditions will help us to understand how and why the dead returned to life in the bodies of these young men of prehistory. It is 1000 AD in northern Germany. You watch as a spectral host gallops madly through the night sky overhead before descending to fly across field and forest and then careering through the darkness of your village streets. They are led by a great figure with a long grey beard atop a massive horse. This is the Wild Hunt. This mounted host contains armed men who might do battle with one another as they charge through the shadows, riding horses with two or three or six or eight legs. With them are baying dogs and wolves walking on their hind legs. And these werewolves might at any moment suddenly burst into your house to steal your beer and your food. There is a single man striding out in front of the oncoming host, calling out loudly as he approaches, warning people to get out of the streets. Behind him comes the wild riders, dressed all in black with blackened faces, some riding on the back of a wagon pulled by painted horses. One man strides past while juggling and another walks on his hands, while two more turn somersaults and cartwheels down the dark streets. In amongst the grotesque retinue you are sure you catch a glimpse of two people from your village who died earlier this year. Another figure rushes past, his eyes blazing out from the shadows of his hood. Despite these horrific sights and the terrible cacophony and the thieving wild werewolves and monsters with glowing eyes, all the people of your village have turned out in the streets to cheer them on because you all know that the coming of the wild hunt is a necessity for it brings fertility to field and flock. Without it, your people are surely doomed. Charging past the villagers, the riders and creatures of this mad retinue are in pursuit of three female demons who they must catch and truss up tightly before flinging them over their horses to be carried away again into the night. With your home ravaged by these invaders, you emerge to watch them disappearing into the shadows, not to be seen again until this time next year. And you are contented that all has gone well. So goes one wild hunt, carried out by the people of your village. Different localities have their own versions and their own stories associated with this tradition, and it varied widely across time and place. Sometimes there is just a single master hunter who rides through on his horse with his great hounds at his heels or the hunt leader might even be a huntress. These traditions were found from the British Isles and Scandinavia to France and southern Germany under various names and in some places the practices continued into the early 20th century. This traditional activity usually took place during the holy 12 nights between Christmas and Epiphany and also, especially in Germany, during Carnival 
That's the period between Christmas and Lent, and sometimes on the eve of other important feasts. So, what are we to make of this strange practice? Well, there's been an enormous amount of scholarship done over the decades, over the centuries really, on this widespread, well-attested tradition. And there's no doubt that it comes from the cultic practices of the Odin or Wodan cult. But in the descendant cultures after Northern Europe was Christianized, the leader of the hunt becomes different figures from history or legend or even from the Bible. But this isn't a video about the wild hunt. We will have to make a separate a separate one of those if you're interested. The point here is that the riders with blackened faces, the spectral hosts, are ultimately a carryover, much changed perhaps, but a continuation of the earlier tradition of the Corios. The Corios members were of course flesh and blood, filled with the vigour and vitality of youth actually, and as we spoke about in a previous video they also embodied the power of wild carnivores like bears and wolves. However, the Corios was also in part a kind of cult of the dead. And this aspect of the Corios explains so much of their behaviour as well as the mythology and folklore from far later descendant Indo-European cultures. So what are we talking about when we say a cult of the dead? First of all, we need to be clear about the word cult, which is often employed as a pejorative today used to mean a group of people who are excessively devoted to something outside of the norm. But forget that, we mean it in the original sense of the word, used by ancient historians and modern anthropologists. It's a set of religious devotional practices that are conventional within their culture, and these practices often relate to a specific person or place. It comes from a Latin phrase and it's related to the word cultivate, it's what the adherents of a shrine or a temple would do. They would take care of the gods or heroes of that place through their offerings and rituals that honoured these gods or heroes. So that's the cult part. And by the dead, I mean the men of the clan who had gone before them, the youth's own ancestors, their own kin, stretching back through time. So it's a cult of the ancestors a set of traditions, of ritual practices to do with the ancestors. Okay, so how did these people actually perceive the nature of life and death? Well, our ancestors did not believe that the body has a soul. Rather, it is the soul that has a body. The soul has primacy and the body is a temporary consequence of that soul. What lives on after the body dies is the life force itself. It is the person himself who lives on, freed from his body. And now he is immortal, for he cannot die again. This kind of perspective on death is not limited to ancient Indo-European cultures, of course. It has been observed in many other cultures around the world, and the metaphysical nature of the dead person is very well studied and well understood by anthropologists. Traditional societies then, speaking generally, know the following three things about the person who has died. They know that the dead person actually continues to live, and he is powerful, and he is potentially both well disposed to the living and malicious. This last point demonstrates that there is a certain emotional ambivalence on the part of the living to their dead ancestors. Remember that the dead are powerful, and so they can be very dangerous. But they can also be a valued helper to the tribe and a defender of them. And some cultures around the world are therefore afraid of their dead, while others, others like Indo-European societies, prefer to remain in close communion with their dead. And it is understood that the dead continue to have an interest in the well-being of their kin and tribe. It's obvious, isn't it? I mean, why, why wouldn't they? So traditionally, for the Indo-Europeans, the dead are the honoured ancestors. But they are also far more than that, because they are now immortals, beings in whom that life force, that divine spark in each of us, has become far more powerful in them 
because they are no longer mortal. And for these societies, these honoured ancestors are the men of the tribe. As we said in one of the previous videos on the Koryos, to be a man of the tribe is to be a warrior. And whether the warrior died in his glory, falling in battle, or if he died of withered old age, he lives on in his immortality as the warrior he was in the prime of his youth. Because of course, out of all the people living on earth, still in their bodies, it is in the young warrior that the life force manifests itself most abundantly. Everyone knows that. And it's those immortal warriors who come back. In fact, they never really left. They are still members of the tribe. When the youths of the Koryos transition into manhood, they join the tribe of men. And that means all the men of the tribe, all of the warriors of the tribe who ever lived. And this initiation process, this rite of passage, involves a real death and a real birth. The child dies and the man of the tribe is born. Now that might sound metaphorical or poetic, but it's not. Remember, the metaphysical has primacy. It is the sacred reality that is the primary reality, and the flesh and blood world is merely something that emerges from it. Once initiated, the boy belongs to the dead ancestors who are the immortals, and so the initiate is now more real than the uninitiated. His physical death will now be meaningless, as his true immortality is assured. Of course, he must still win undying glory during his time on earth to secure fame for himself and his people, but now he can never die. And this is why when we hear about the ecstatic warrior bands in history, in Tacitus or Snorri Sturluson, we hear that they had no fear of injury or death. In fact, they could not be killed by normal means. And this is because in a very real sense, the berserker warrior is already dead. And so he is immortal. In rituals around the world, the participants are often masked. Masking has multiple functions, often many at the same time. Sometimes it is to do with questions of identity, hiding the person or transmuting their nature for the duration of the ritual. And in this case, it is the nature of the dead that they are not seen at normal times. They are present, of course, their effects are felt and observed, but they don't have their bodies anymore. And so the dead themselves are not seen. Just as a side note, if the dead are seen outside of the special ritual times of the year, then something is wrong. Spooks, ghouls, dragas, the walking dead and so on. This is an unnatural and unhealthy situation that must be dealt with. So normally the dead are not seen. However, it is an important function of the Koryos youths to make the dead seen at specific ritual times of the year. The special times when the dead are most active it's not exactly that they are representing the dead, standing in for them. They actually make the dead present for these times. They literally are the dead. And the practical way they bring this about includes masking. This is an anthropology word. It doesn't necessarily mean a big flat thing you strap over your face. Masking often means just painting the face and maybe the body too. In my Gods of Bronze novels, the Kurios youths mix ashes and charcoal with rendered animal fat to make a grey-black paint to cake over their faces. If you're into reading fiction, then check out the links to my books in the video description below. Now, listen to this quote from Chris Kershaw's The One-Eyed God, Odin and the Indo-Germanic Manabund, which I recommend wholeheartedly, by the way, and it was a massive inspiration for my Gods of Bronze series and all of these videos about the Koryos. In this quote, she's talking about the practice of masking. Quote, This is one of those fascinating phenomena which can be demonstrated worldwide among peoples who cannot have been in contact for tens of thousands of years. Wherever there are mask cults, there are ancestor cults. The masks transform the wearer into an ancestor. Folklorist Carl Muley gives abundant examples of these cults in the Americas, in Africa, in Australia and in the Pacific Islands. Evidently, the practice answers a pressing, universal human need." End quote. 
She's talking about masks and ancestor cults in general terms being intrinsically linked, but that doesn't mean they're all the same, of course, and it doesn't mean that the practices are ubiquitous or even necessarily widespread within each continent, just that where they do occur, they occur together. Another form of masking we've talked about before is the wearing of animal skins. Remember in the wild hunt, the animals involved in the procession are wolves and dogs, which are associated with the warband, and also the horse. The horse is a deeply significant animal in these societies and it is closely associated with death. That's another subject that will need its own video though. Like with the animal skin wearing young warrior, these masks are not meant to deceive the onlookers, the others involved in the rituals. Instead, the masking separates the participant from the normal world and he is marked out to all that he is in fact a supernatural being. He is himself no longer, now he is an ancestor. So really it doesn't matter what form the masking takes in these various descendant Indo-European societies during these rituals. You might find them in full animal skins or just in animal hoods or caps, or they might have blackened their skin with ashes or whitened it with gypsum. What matters is that this process makes the youth disappear. He is now no longer present and it is not him who is now acting in the world. So what are these later historical festivals when the dead appear? Well, some of them will already be familiar. They include Yule and Carnival, Saturnalia and Compitalia, two related Roman festivals, and Anthesteria and Dionysia, two Dionysian Greek festivals. All of these are in part a later form of the visitation of the ancestors. But why have the ancestors come back? Remember, they care about their descendants. In fact, they are still part of the tribe. And it's more than that, because it is our ancestors who gave us not only our lives, but our way of life, our customs, laws, taboos and law. And so they return at these specific times of the year to guard the order that they themselves established. Once I read someone, uh, I can't remember who, called them spiritual policemen. That stuck in my mind, but they're basically, they're enforcers of order. They conserve the way things have always been. And they do this by being embodied in the Corios youths during the festivals. And perhaps this seems strange because as we've spent other videos talking about, the Corios is a band of wild and lawless thieves and cattle rustlers, right? Well, yeah, they certainly are, but that's during the period of time when they are ejected from home and they are now beyond the laws of the land because they're no longer of the land. Well, okay, but didn't I also describe a scene of chaotic disorder at the start of this video? A scene of werewolves, obviously curious youths in wolf skins, breaking into houses to steal beer. Well, this is the sort of seemingly contradictory tradition that it takes a minute to explain before we can understand what's really going on. But the fact is, in every culture in which they appear, it's these youthful bands that are actually responsible for social and civic order. It's not really, and I mean by that, metaphysically which is the only true reality it's not really the boys imposing order at all but the ancestors and it's the ancestors who require a religious devotion just like those shrines of the gods and ancestors that must be cultivated by the people of the tribe the women and children and lower ranks are a part of the wider society but they are not of the warrior society itself and so they are part of the ritual, but they must not come into contact with the sacred itself. And that's why you have that figure in the wild hunt, the warner, striding ahead of the procession, a warner shouting that everyone must clear the streets, perhaps ringing a bell or playing a loud musical instrument. The ancestors have come, returned for their devotion, for their offerings to be cultivated. As they are now present and seen, they are guests and expect to be given food and drink to honour them. 
and so it is their right to break into any house or inn or even to ride their horses through the front door and drink the place dry and take whatever they fancy. If they receive the required devotions and also find that everything is in order, that all social strictures are being followed and that no taboos are being broken, then they will shower the house or village or farm or polis with blessings for the coming year, all the way to the next visitation of the ancestors. But if they do not find everything is in order, if they do not receive the proper welcome, then their punishment will be immediate and it will be brutal. They might tear down the thatch from the roof and rip the doors from their hinges. In extreme cases, they will destroy the house entirely, breaking it into sticks and rubble. And they will pour a sack of salt down their well for good measure. This seems extraordinary to us. It hardly seems like it could be real. After all, these were their own people doing these terrible things. But these practices are well attested. There's no doubt that this describes enduring traditions. This stuff really happened. And maybe we can easily understand the actions of the boys. They had undergone some secret rituals and they had truly become the dead. They were now their ancestors and they were enforcing the law. And no doubt acting in this way had its own ecstatic thrill. And the beer probably helped. But it's harder for us perhaps to understand everyone else. Didn't they know that these monsters ripping down the house with their own sons and brothers why would you let your son and your your cousin's boy from next door tear down your house because you stepped out of line well these rites these festivals are a kind of sacred time for everyone in the tribe normality is banished for the duration and all the society together participate in a kind of collective ritual activity the warner who goes through the streets telling them to get out of the way is not banishing them from the ritual. That is the ritual. They are all part of it. The really amazing thing though is that the forms of these practices persisted for so long in so many places. Even though much of the deeper meaning was lost, the celebrants knew it was just their kids in those costumes, but they also still truly believed they would bring blessings. And that's why the tradition was so enduring. Even into historical times, the visitation of the ancestors' ritual brings blessings to family, flock and field because everyone knows the ancestors care about their descendants. And because they have become powerful in their state of immortal life, they have the power to influence this good fortune. These great processions were a vitally important part of Indo-European cultures where bands of ecstatics go about the land spreading blessings and good fortune. These great annual feasts encompassed every aspect of community life and every group or representatives of every group participated as all had their own parts to play. And there are fertility rites in every great feast even in societies that are not primarily agricultural. This quote from Chris Kershaw stayed with me ever since I first read it, especially the first sentence. If the women do not bear and the cows do not carve, the folk will not thrive even if the men are successful in battle. Thus, it is not surprising to find weapon dances and rain dances as part of the same celebration, or to find armed men in wolf masks and a wagon bearing a sun wheel in the same procession towards the cult site." End quote. So when we say that the Koryos was a chaotic army of the dead that brought the blessings of life and good order to the living, it makes complete sense. You know, I have my own Koryos. These are some of the members on screen now. It's called the Order of the White Dagger, and you can be part of it by joining us on Patreon. The link is in the description. If you liked this video, please do subscribe to the channel and check out the playlists for more content like this. You will like the Bronze Age Warfare playlist, which this is part of, and the People of the Bronze Age playlist. So you should definitely binge all of them. Thank you for watching.